Hey everybody, so welcome to another edition of Reading Fun in the Sun. I am at camp this weekend. As you probably can tell, it is now the closing of today and we are going to have a campfire. But before I go and do that, I have actually been working my way through a book all about the ethics in data science. And it's a great read because each use case, each story is from an industry leader and it's maybe a page or two long. So I've been slowly making my way through this. Some are really insightful while others actually have some problems with. But whatever the case is, ethics in data science, making sure that we're doing this appropriately and without harming others, or at least trying our best to do it without manipulating the data to meet our worldview and maybe putting people in jeopardy is something that I really feel passionate about. So if you also feel passionate about this, stay tuned and let's go and review some of the stories from industry leaders. Make sure you stay till the end of this video so you can find out how you can win this video's giveaway for a copy of the book we are reviewing. I love this book because it is broken up into very bite-sized pieces. So if you just want to grab a story or two from use cases or understand what are some general policies that some big ticket names in the industry are using, this book allows you to do that. All right, so the structure of this video is I'm going to go over some of the notable figures and companies that have presented in this book. And then I'm going to go through some of the themes that I picked out and the stories that support them from the book. So the main themes here are transparency and trust, do no harm and how I think that's somewhat of a cop out, targets and usage and how to do that well without you know hurting anyone. And the last is unforeseen or unintended consequences when it comes to data. All right, so let's get started. Some notable figures that make an appearance in this book are Cassie Kazrakoff, which if you don't know her channel, I'll link it up above. She is absolutely amazing. She is one of the head data scientists at Google. There are quite a few academic researchers in this as well, uh, from places like UNC, Berkeley, University of Akron, uh, University of Dublin, quite a few others. I actually would say that one of my small criticisms of this book is, while it is fantastic to see the plethora of uh, industry leaders from Teradata, IBM, Ameritrade, Charles Schwab, Lowe's, AWS, eBay, Coca-Cola, a whole lot of great people uh, from industry. There's also, uh, I think, maybe too many in the academic space, not to discount folks that are doing this in academia, but it is, I think, more helpful to see how people in the real world who are constantly working with the end user, with the end customer, uh, actually interacts with ethics in their data science. And I would also say that some notable universities that do a lot in this space, like Carnegie Mellon, MIT, Stanford, do not make an appearance, which I'm kind of curious as to what they would have to say about these ethics and the considerations in data science. So some of the key themes, I'm going to go over the key themes that I pulled out of this book and note some of the stories that you might want to check out from the book if you are interested in learning more about those themes. So theme number one is transparency. This sounds like something that we've been talking about since the dawn of time with data science, but transparency on the data side, transparency with your end users, the folks that are actually contributing to your data sources, having them understand what you're actually doing with that data, not just from a very basic understanding, which is what we have when you're talking about like GDPR and things, but more so what are those algorithms doing? What are they measuring? How are they determining something is like something else? And this doesn't have to give away the store and you want this to be relatable and understandable AI for your end user, but people understand a lot more about, in general, what machine learning can do and what data scientists do. And this is a fabulous way to impart trust from your end users or from the people that are actually giving you the data. So this is one thing that is noted from pages 68 to 70 where the contributor is talking about how to ask 
for customers' data with transparency and trust, making sure that they understand what is it actually going to be used for and who specifically is going to be able to use it. This is also covered in two other contributions. One on page 193, where they're talking about the equality of distributing ethical outcomes in a digital age. So there are three different aspects they're looking at. Two additional examples I want to highlight actually go through specific pieces of that trust factor in that transparency. The first of which starts on page 193, where the author goes through respect for persons, which is protecting the autonomy of all people, benefits, which is the philosophy of do no harm. We're gonna come back to that one in a moment. And then justice, making sure that the reasonable and non-exploitative and well-considered processes and procedures are actually being followed. The next is a fabulous rundown and summary of the Stephen Covey 13 ways to define trust and behaviors in a leader. This starts on page 34, where the areas that they cover are listen first, extend trust, clarify expectations, confront reality, create transparency, deliver results, practice accountability, and just get better. Let's take a moment and talk about the phrase do no harm. This is really a very common phrase amongst data scientists. There are, in addition to the one I just mentioned, two additional areas in the book that cover this. The first is on page 21, where the author is describing how uh, Kathy O'Neill's influential book, Weapons of Math Destruction, where algorithms can actually do harm and sometimes you don't even realize it. Um, and how sometimes you have to make sure your heart is, is in the right place. I have some issues with that. And then the second one I also have some issues with are starting on page 45 with first, do no harm is the title of that section. Now, the sentiment behind do no harm is correct. We should strive never to do harm. But sometimes I feel that this is used to give a pass for past wrongs, things that are currently wrong, or just not knowing if you are doing wrong. And I think that is a sentiment more appropriate to the story of transparency. It's also transparency within your own organization as to when you are actually doing harm, when you are actually going to fix what has been done in the past, and how you can make it a repeatable process on your data and your processes to understand when you may actually be doing harm or when you don't actually know if you are doing harm or not. If you cannot measure something, you cannot trust it. And that's something that a lot of companies struggle with because it's, it's hard to quantify everything. And maybe not everything needs to be quantified. However, the things that affect people probably do need to be measured so that one, you can track what's going on and understand when there are issues for instance, if there's some kind of threat to that data or to the peoples associated with that data, and also making sure that the company does truly understand when and if they are doing harm. The next theme is appropriate targets and usage. So this one, I think, covers not just those in industry, but also academia. So often people think that I can get a data set. In fact, there is a link I'll put up above to my video all about where to find free and open data sources. Here's the thing. You always have to look at where does the data come from, but also who does it represent? For instance, if you're just doing some basic entity extraction and you're using a giant open source corpus of content. That might be okay because you're really just trying to extract things that might be named entities of any sort. But if you are trying to do, let's say, sentiment analysis, you might want to make sure that the sources that you are deriving from are more reputable because you don't want the sentiment to be overly skewed one way or the other. Same goes for image recognition. If you are training image recognition to determine 
something is a cat or a dog, maybe that's not as critical if you maybe get it wrong. But if you are trying to identify someone's gender, this is covered on page 174 with an article on use model agnostic explanations for finding bias in black box models. And that one is specifically talking about how gender is skewed when you are using black boxes. You don't understand what the end data source is. Something to watch out for with black boxes specifically. Another is on page 218, and this one's talking about ethical data science, both art and science, where this is taken in a more positive note, where machine learning and data science can actually do good things when it is looking at specific genders, making it more equitable to genders that are maybe not as prevalent, let's say, in computer science. Then you can focus on enhancing those aspects so that it is more equitable for those groups that may not be as prevalent in the data sets normally. There are quite a few stories here that are also talking about the unfairness of some of these data sets. If you're looking at the whole as an equal, then you may be missing out on some subsets that don't fit that exact model. So a good example of this is on page 243 with the article to fight bias in predictive policing, justice can't be colorblind. So this is something where if you are only looking at a, a, a global population or a specific population, and you're not looking at the specificities of those, you can actually be overfitting your model to actually support the bias that you already have because you're looking at just a global population of a certain class, ethnicity, you name it. This is something that we all have to be very aware of. There's another case on page 157 with an article titled Ethics, Trading, and Artificial Intelligence where the actual um, trade behavior is also looking again at too much of a global population and not necessarily looking at the specificities of the individual groups where this information is coming from or in this case where the trading is actually going on and the last thing that we're going to talk about is the unforeseen and unintended consequences of data the first article that i'm going to highlight here is on page 100 and that is algorithms are used differently than human decision makers well, of course they are. That's why the algorithms actually have to be calibrated by humans to treat those data sets ethically and accurately. This is something that is also covered very heavily in the book where algorithms are created by people. Data sets are created by people. And therefore the biases inherent in those two things are going to show and manifest in the algorithms and the data sets. And this is something that you really do need to be a, be careful of and constantly be looking for. That's one of the things that is really highlighted in this book is that these things can be tried and tested before they're in use. But if you are working with a data set that is being updated, or if you are not watching what your algorithm is doing, it can actually start to deteriorate or more biases can be integrated into it without you realizing it. It is not a set it and forget it moment. This is something that you really have to put into place during your processing. How's your pipeline measuring this constantly so that you can avoid introducing more biases if you've already tried to stop them. Two that I found really insightful uh, in this book. The first is avoiding the wrong part of the creepiness scale where some people will find something very useful. Alexa is a great example where I've been on conference calls where someone has said jokingly, Alexa, play Guns N' Roses. And then someone else had an Alexa, heard it, and Alexa started playing it. Oh, that's cute and funny and perhaps helpful. But when you start to realize that Alexa is constantly listening to you, I'm not picking on Alexa here, by the way, this is just an example. Lots of chatbots and lots of assistants do this. And a lot of things uh, connected to your behavior online do this. They're listening to you constantly. So if you start to talk about how you really love uh, something, that something may start to pop up in your ads. There is a reason for that. You might find that helpful, but you need to make sure as the people working with the data that you don't get into that creepiness scale where you're like, oh no, I don't want this to happen. A good example of this 
is uh, Target actually was sending out ads to new mothers or expecting mothers. And uh, unfortunately, somebody uh, who did not tell their parents that they were expecting was getting these ads. Their parents found out. Not the greatest way to tell your parents that you are expecting. And closing out, I want to highlight two other articles. The first is on page 103, which is pay off your fairness debt, the shadow twin of technical debt. So this is something that I, I very much agree on, and that is that everyone is so focused on decreasing their technical debt, but they're not thinking of the fairness debt. And this one is really focused on be careful what you wish for. If you are dealing with data and your metric is go from one minute of usage on your tool to two minutes of usage on your tool, but you don't set those boundaries, you don't set the goodness of fit for your end use case, what if you go from one minute to eight hours, which is what the article is talking about? That goes from not as efficient to very dangerous. Uh, there is the well-known fact that YouTube likes you to keep clicking and clicking and clicking into things, but how much is too much? The iPhone now actually tracks how long you spend on any given app, and it allows you to give yourself a cutoff time. And the reason for that is a lot of these companies have not thought through, I want to increase usage, but to what effect and for how long? This is also something that a lot of startups suffer from, which is move fast, break things, move on. And the issue is just like with technical debt, once you become solvent, you look back on what you've done and you see a, 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 a path of destruction. That can happen with the data as well. If you're not careful with what data you're using, if you're just throwing you know, cannon fodder essentially at your systems, and you don't care about the people you are affecting or the people that that data is coming from or is affecting from that data set, you can actually be leaving behind a, a path of destruction that as a startup, you might not realize that impact until you are successful and then it's too late. And along those same veins is on page 136, the golden rule of data science. Now, this article is a little disappointing because it doesn't actually come out and say, here is the golden rule of data science. And it can be provocative to say, is that actually the, the, the golden rule or not? But what it does do is it highlights on, we again are using data as cannon fodder. We're just shoving as much data as possible at things in hopes that the machine gets it. But what you don't realize is the more data you collect, the more risk you involved with the people and the the end user and all of the in between you have to be very mindful of the data that you are collecting is it the right data is the is the data amount correct it's not always about give me more give me more i am i am a bottomless pit for data that is the very easiest way to get to ruin because then when you get audited, you don't know where anything is, you don't know why you have what you have, you have no idea the impact of that data, who it's affecting, you have no idea how it's being used in your algorithms. The more data you have, the harder it is to track. So make sure you are mindful about the data that you are using. That's another key component to this book. I'm not going to go over it in this video because it is too much to cover, but this book doesn't only tell you the pitfalls and common issues that we should be looking at, but how specific companies have tried to address ethics in their companies and universities. So make sure you check it out. Thank you to those who have stuck around till the end. So if you would like your own copy, I have only one to give away. Please make sure that you like this video, make sure you are subscribed and leave a comment below that you are interested in the book and one of the most insightful things you got from this video. All the details are listed down below in case you need it. And there's also in the description box, a link to a free trial for 30 days for O'Reilly if you are interested in that. Thank you very much for watching and I'll catch you next time.